So uh, my name is Lena. I am Danzig. I'm at Cardiff University uh, in the UK, and I'm also um, work at this place we call Data Justice Lab, which is this new, um, newish um, research center esque thing um, space for sort of collaboration and dedicated to the question of data justice looking at the interrelation between datafication and social justice. And so uh, what I'll talk about here is not uh, so much a project, but some, some ideas of the kind of research that uh, might be um, necessary in order to approach this topic of, of data justice. So first of all, the question of how does your uh, work approach um, data justice? The starting point for me in this is about the kind of the nature and the meaning of the transformation that's brought about with datafication. Um, so the extent of, of datafication, the extent to which we're immersed in a, in a sort of datafied society, but also what does it actually do to that society? What does it mean um, for um, society? Particularly because it's used now across um, social life. So it's for me like very significant that this is actually about our ability to participate in society because it comes to inform decisions about our ability to access services or our ability to um, um, engage in, in society in different ways and how we are treated within um, society. So new forms of, of decision making and new forms of, of governance that emerge with the data fight society. And of course there are examples of this in terms of how we get an automated border control, for example, or data driven border control. So the risk scores that are generated then within our workplace increasingly is becoming data fight also in that we are um, having to work to, to an algorithm or data score of some sort or another. Um, across different workplaces, or even the famous sort of story now with the ProPublica piece on the way in which data is used to inform also risk scores <laughs> about whether somebody should be or how long someone should be sentenced for, go to prison, also informed by, by data. So for me, data justice, therefore, and then oh, the second part of it, that's the first bit, the nature of the transformation. The second part of it that I come to this topic from is the nature of the engagement or the critical engagement that we've had with questions of data so far. And that links directly with previous research um, that I've been in involved in that has looked at civil society responses or activist responses to questions around data and technology, where we found that it's predominantly been confined to sort of technical responses, so privacy enhancing technology, encryption, those types of, of responses to how we might resist data, um, or a question around policy related to the protection of personal data. So again, it's this kind of, uh, we call it sort of um, techno-legal solutionism around the question of individual privacy and around the question of protection of, of personal data. And I don't think that the nature of the transformation necessarily is met then with that response. Is that response adequate or do we need to actually think about the implications of datafication differently? Much more linked to questions of social and economic rights, for example, that are implicated when we look at what is actually happening in a datafied society. So it's those two kinds of, of questions that bring me to this question of data justice. So for me, data justice is an indication of a shift in understanding of what is at stake with datafication. So especially as it becomes a, a form of governance. So for me, it becomes a question of social justice. So how do data-driven systems relate to questions of equality, fairness, and distribution of power that we associate with this concept of social justice often? That's for the first question then. So what does my work tell us about the mobilization of data? Uh, I'm not going to repeat the questions. OK, um, so for me, it becomes important then to study what are the implications of this? So how is justice practiced in relation to data? Which would also tell us something about how society is ordered. So how do these practices then also lead to injustices? Those questions. Um, we can think of this, I think, in several different ways. We can think of it in terms of the objectives of the system. So what and who are they for? What are the interests guiding data-driven systems, for example? Um, Often we have questions that this is about efficiency or economic growth, state security, the monetization of risk. That's the vision of society that's often presented when we look at data-driven forms of, of governance, certainly. Um, and then also, what is the view of society uh, that is being advanced? And here, I think data-driven systems tend to advance an aggregation of decontextualized individuals in a sort of flat structure, in that it's very bad at accounting for existing inequalities that happen in society. It treats society as sort of flat, homogenous um, populations. And the idea is to aggregate data that tells us something about group profiling, group traits, in order to try and predict what individuals might do in the future. 
And then also the view of human nature that's often presented in this uh, data-driven, these data-driven systems are as rational, self-interested, and predictable. Um, and that it's about uh, focused on the question of what someone might do in the future rather than who they actually are. And so injustices, I think, uh, occur at all these different levels, at all these different points. Objectives undermine often this uh, concern with efficiency and economic growth can undermine equality or fair treatment of, of communities, people's rights. So data-driven systems are often focused on particular parts of society. If you look at something like predictive policing, it's often policing of poor neighborhoods. It's not the policing of white color crime, for example. Efforts are placed in certain parts of society. Also, there's a new power symmetry between those who are able to actually do the profiling versus those who are subjected to those profiles. And also this view of society, we see injustices occur there because data doesn't fall to quote Virginia Eubanks on smooth ground, right? We don't live in a flat society in this way. Society is complex, it's history, structural inequalities and so forth. And also data processes can actually further those um, kinds of inequalities and implicates people differently and can discriminate and so forth. And human nature is defined partly also by social context, and there's also distortion and types of agency that data systems might struggle to, to counter for, and that would also create types of injustices. So there's a new politics of social justice that emerges in these distances between data control, data subjects, and actual social life. So in terms of how data-driven systems order society versus how uh, social and economic rights are historically advanced and protected. So what are the types of categories of people that are being advanced versus the types of categories we have in place to protect social and economic rights? What's the distance there? A new politics of social justice might emerge there. The second one is in terms of how data subjects are created versus lived experience. So what is the distance there between how data-driven systems view people versus their actual lives? And uh, politics of social justice also emerges there. Sorry. So the methods and practices that I want to pursue then, for me then, this means that we have to study the impact of datafication on particular communities and think about how they are negotiated. And for me, I'm particularly interested in studying historically missed or underrepresented communities where this disparity of impact really is brought to life and becomes very clear. So those on the margins of society to understand how data justice and injustice might be manifested. And this requires a sort of holistic approach, I think, based around concrete case studies and scenarios. Something we're quite keen on in the Data Justice Lab is to try and have more concrete sort of understanding of these types of developments. Looking at different case studies, tracing what kind of companies are being um, you know, contracted uh, to provide these data-driven systems, the nature of the software, the types of data that's being used, then looking at actually integrated, because that is not enough. Too many studies are focused on just the technical level. We need to actually understand that in social context, look at the actual practices. So how are they being used by those who are sitting in different institutions that are, are making decisions? Um, what are then the actual experiences or the actual impact of communities, organizations working with those communities that can then feed into questions around policy um, and policy implications? So I have, uh, and then for this actually to practice a sort of um, engage research to work then also with these communities that we, we would be looking at to understand what data justice actually might look like. So in terms of the principles and objectives that might get, uh, then need to be guiding data driven systems, the regulation, the design, and one that draws on a cross section of movements across technology and social justice concerns, integrating data into longer standing social justice agendas, which is another key aim of this data justice lab, is to bring data into existing social justice agendas in a way that they're disconnected at the moment. So where I'm heading with this now is, so to do work with this um, place that we set up, this data justice lab that's committed to some of these types of questions, and try and get money to do projects or just do projects, which now not spend so much time maybe writing grant applications, but mm -hmm. maybe doing research is what we want to do. And then also um, creating pla a place or space for engaging different activists across, or different communities across uh, civil society that may not at the moment particularly feel that they need to engage with questions of data, but by highlighting some of these mm -hmm. developments, actually getting to understand how they might do that, and then also learn from these communities to think about how we need to understand these systems in a way that speaks to their justice agendas, need be. Okay, thank you, that was fast, sorry, the end. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, hi everyone, my name is Joanna Redden. I'm also from Cardiff University and um, like Lena, uh, uh, work at the Data Justice Lab. And what I'm gonna talk about today um, is an example of, of one of the kinds of things um, that we're working on. And uh, it's an example of uh, the kinds of questions that we would ask and consider. So, um, how, how do I approach this issue of data justice? And I begin um, from the position that with big data comes promise and risk, not a radical position, of course. This is a position that there's increasing consensus about. Um, and I come from the position that the integration of big data systems into public service could provide a wide range of benefits, could lead to improved services, for example, by helping those in the public service identify those who are more in need of supports and services and early interventions. Um, but I'm really interested in the harms that can be caused by use of big data. Issues of the ish ongoing issues of privacy, anonymization, and security. Um, but for me, one of the biggest issues I'm concerned about is the potential for data governance to increase inequality. So we all know um, and are learning more and more all the time about the ways that new big data tools can present new ways to sort, profile, exclude, exploit, and discriminate. Um, and the central premise of this project that I'm working on, the Big Data and Governance Project, is that analytically mapping where and how big data is being used in public services is necessary to understand how systems of governance and the management of public services are changing. So for me, where I begin when I, when I think about data justice, we need to know a whole lot more about what's going on. And the problem is we know, we know anecdotal things, we know anecdotally where big data may be being used, um, but we don't, know, um, we don't know the specifics. And I think we actually need a concrete mapping at this point in order to engage um, with what's happening. We also need to learn from where things have gone wrong and where things have gone right. We need a record. Um, and I would argue that by fully assessing the present moment, we gain a better appreciation of where we are heading and where we may want to change course. So what I've been doing now um, is mapping where and how big data is being used within the government of Canada and compiling a record of data harms. Um, so we have concrete examples of where things have gone wrong that we can learn from. The project I'm going to talk about today, um, and I'm going to use as an illustrative example of the importance of this mapping and, um, and this record, um, is a project that involves um, looking at how big data is being integrated into child welfare um, in the United Kingdom. And what that means is how predictive analytics are being introduced into areas of social work and influencing decisions that are made about children and families and whether or not to take children away from their parents. So broadly, the research questions that are forming my approach to data justice, the mapping, where and how is big data being integrated, um, specifically in relation to social policy and services, drawing on Kitchen and Lorio, attention to this <laughs> idea of, of data assemblages, looking at the contextual factors, looking at the practices, looking at the actors, looking at the political climates, um, looking at legislative frameworks and infrastructure, um, developing this complex notion of what's actually happening in the various different ways that big data is used and then assessing the benefits and harms and learning from some of those things. I would also argue that it's really important um, to develop a record of data harms. We need far more um, kind of cross-national learning. Um, we need to learn from where things have gone wrong. And the key point with all of this is that, um, and the reason why I'm becoming more convinced this is really important, is because we're seeing more and more that there's this recognition that with big data comes risk, right? This isn't all the government reports, it's said everywhere. Um, there are, are some examples of where things have gone wrong, but more and more we're seeing this, this notion um, that with big data comes risk, it gets dismissed. Um, and it gets overridden and said, but yeah, but the benefits are so high that we must, we must move forward. And I would argue that it's at that moment that we need to intervene and we need to actually develop a far more nuanced and complicated discussion based on these previous examples um, because this dismissal needs to be challenged. Okay, so where am I heading now um, with all of this? Um, I'm really interested in changing relations and information systems as governments start to integrate more uses of big data. There's a lot of interest in the private sector, these are just two examples, um, in, in getting in datafying public services and getting, in getting um, the public sector to buy into some of these data practices either by contracting out, by buying off the shelf, or by developing partnerships. Um, and so when it comes to child welfare, 
Uh, this is just my illustrative example of why this is so important. Uh, when it comes to child welfare, what we know um, is that big data is being, thank you, being um, integrated into child welfare practices in the US, in Australia. It's being talked about in New Zealand. It's happening in Canada, and it's now happening in the UK. Um, and these initiatives, when big data gets introduced into child welfare <coughs> systems, the aim is to bring, together, to bring together data from databases across the welfare sector, and I'm quoting Gillingham and Graham here, um, in order to apply innovative approaches to analyze large, complex data to provide evidence to support the decision making of frontline social workers, right? And as you can probably um, kind of guess from the places I just mentioned, these are, these are contexts where there have been major cuts um, to social services, right? And that context is really important. <clears throat> So as with other countries, um, in the UK, predictive analytics is being um, introduced in public services to save money. Um, Kent County Council is one example, and I'm going to draw on some research that was done by Malamo and Sino here. Um, and with Kent County Council, for example, that council was facing major <coughs> cuts. Um, they needed a way to, to become more efficient, but there's also an argument there that their argument was, okay, if we get a better sense of where things might go wrong in the future, maybe we could invest more in preventing some of these things from happening down the road. Maybe we can use our big data in a way to, to put our resources where it might help and prevent future problems. Um, the issue <coughs> is how this happens and what happens when you start, when you start integrating commercial tools um, with public service and public sector priorities. Um, and so one of the way that their integrated data model was used was um, it's, it's in complement to this tool provided by Mosaic, which helps provide some of this context, raises a lot of questions because of the way this, um, these tools start to segment and compartmentalize people, right? Um, what kind of categories are being created? Um, what happens with the social sorting? How is the social sorting used? I mean, the questions go on and on and on, um, which I think demonstrates the importance of really getting in there and doing research um, and how this stuff is being used and how these partnerships are developing and what kind of new information models are being developed. OK. <clears throat> so if we move away from Kent for instance, what can we learn from what's happened in other places where big data has been integrated into public services? Um, what can we learn from other places where people have raised questions and, and, and John critiques? So um, I'll talk about in New Zealand really quickly. So in New Zealand, the government proposed <coughs> developing a predictive risk model that aimed to reduce child abuse and neglect. Um, the model was criticized. The government made it public leading to all kinds of people coming forward and identifying and critiquing the model um, for the way that it disproportionately harmed the poor or disproportionately in a very discriminatory way um, would lead to reduced um, or more negative impacts on poor people. So um, the critiques that were put forward was about how the model punished the poor um, because some of the highest weighted variables used in, in their predictive risk model were proxies for poverty, actually. Um, so it meant that low-income families would be disproportionately affected. The public assistance database, for example, was used to train the algorithm and develop the model. That was one of the problems um, that, in that it would lead to um, a model that would disproportionately target those on low income. The length of time a parent was on benefits was used as a significant variable. Being, being a single parent was uh, weighted disproportionately. Um, so being a single parent would have treated it as a variable in a really problematic way, even though there's no conclusive evidence to suggest that being a single parent means there's a greater likelihood you're going to abuse your kid. Um, the caregiver's care and protection history as a child it was included as a variable. I mean, on and on it goes. You see what I'm getting at, right? That, that the, these are the kinds of concrete details that we need if we're going to assess um, how these models are being integrated in local councils in the UK, how families might be worse off, um, and, and things like that. So despite this, despite these concerns, what we have is that when people raise concerns about predictive modeling in child welfare, this is where we're at with New Zealand. New Zealand is now saying it's not testing it, and it's now saying, OK, we know there are all these risks. But we, maybe we can significantly mitigate them, and even still, don't the benefits outweigh mm -hmm. the risks? And this is where we're at. And this is why 
you know, we have to be very, very conscious of where these things, where these problems become dismissed, and this is where we must engage and intervene, and this is why mapping is so important. So, um, just to conclude, what does my study tell us about the mobilization of data for control resistance? Um, it tells us that we need more attention to public-private partnerships, we need more attention to data sharing, how it's being used. We must be important and alert to agency. We can learn from where things have gone right. We can learn from where contestation works in proactive ways. Um, and of course, as Lena was talking about, data literacy is the key. We have to engage more directly with how people are experiencing some of these um, new programs and services so that we can see what's happening. Thank you very much. So my name is Patrick McCurdy, I'm at uh, the University of Ottawa. I will just pass this around. I only have one copy of it, I left the others in my office. It's sort of like the point I get to on, on uh, slide four, but it takes a while to go around. So um, data justice isn't something that I would naturally put my work into, but because a lot of my work uh, deals with sort of media as a site and source of political struggle, I think it sort of fits in with this. Um, and it's been a current theme of uh, my work on uh, activism, my work on protest camps. And when I moved back to Canada in 2011, I wanted to engage in a topic, continuing this interest in, in activism and, and media and struggle, but engage in something which had a bit of a Canadian angle to it. And so what the decision was for me was to look at uh, the, the debate over the oil sands, sort of tar sands uh, debate. And this is one of Canada's, arguably one of its most contentious sort of national and international issues. So the, the goal of the, the project that started in 2014 was to create, for lack of a better word, a sort of Google image database of oil sands propaganda, tar sands propaganda. Uh, and uh, I managed to get some funding from, uh, from SHIRT to do this. And the, the project, the website went live in August of last year, August 2016. And you can access it on mediatoil.ca, so you can take a look at what I'm talking about. Uh, it's currently hosted on Compute Canada's uh, web servers, and that was something I'll get to in one of the slides. It was a big issue of like trying to do this, and I partnered with the Department of Computer Science. We had a computer science master's student help build this from scratch, but even how to get this project up and running. Initially, we hosted it on Microsoft Azure because uh, the university is so slow to be able to provide the resources to get this project up, uh, up and running. Uh, and then it, uh, it, uh, Shirk, uh, it won uh, the Open Data Challenge Award last uh, September as well for, for the project. So what is it? It is a sort of a bespoke uh, content-based image retrieval system of uh, various oil sands uh, material. Uh, and this is all research from, uh, from scratch in that we didn't, uh, we didn't have crawlers gathering the material. We did that a couple of times to check a website for things that were missing. But it involved identifying various stakeholders, going through their websites, going through the Wayback Machine, going through the archives to put this all together. So it wasn't a pre-existing data set, nor was this actual this framework uh, which we use, uh, did, did it exist? Now, it is something that because we built it, if people want to do something similar for any other topic, you name it, then you can use this, right? You need a computer programmer, perhaps, to sort of work on it, but the interface, all of that is, is there. We built it from, uh, from scratch. Um, so we had a total of uh, 99 different stakeholders uh, divided across industry, federal government, provincial government, civil society, and Aboriginal groups. Uh, and we had to take anywhere, anything from uh, analog sources, from archives, going in archives, corporate report covers, to some digital sources, ads uh, on YouTube and, and such. And the idea here was to really expand the type of material that is used, okay, and I'll talk about that a bit as well. The majority, the database has about uh, 3,000 uh, image uh, artifacts in it. Uh, the majority of the content is from 2008 forward. Um, I had to stop data collection uh, at the end of December 2015, uh, simply because we didn't have the resources and we had to focus on, there was so much time on sort of building this, trying to figure out how to manage the data and make it work, uh, that we had to stop data collection. So there are new sort of uh, Enbridge ads and stuff out there, but this is, this was, that was, uh, that was the idea. So the thing behind it is that to, to engage in sort of uh, resistance, we need to know what, what, what we're dealing with. And so the, the driving question of the Mediatoil project was how have various stakeholders uh, represented the issues around uh, the oil sands. And so uh, the idea was to consciously expand what we often focus on on the data. So the idea is to look at, uh, again, corporate report covers, fact sheets, photographs, still ads, video ads, whatever we could find. Now, um, the, the academic articles I've written uh, about on this, uh, I focused on, sort of on advertising specifically, but 
one of the projects in the future is uh, that's on, I'd like to do is to look at, for, for example, how have oil companies over time uh, represented the issues of wind and solar uh, in their corporate report? Is it just window dressing? And look at the images compared to the actual numbers. Um, so for me, then, when I'm thinking about data in this context, it's not just uh, sort of the, 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 your, your tweets and we look at that Facebook post, Instagram pictures, uh, and these other digital out outputs, but a lot of the analog data too. Again, these old corporate reports, uh, because of, uh, the, the traditional print ads, TV ads, because if media is indeed this site of struggle, then uh, what is interesting is how, how, how has this messaging changed over time? And there are some threads which we have uh, sort of looked at and I can talk to as well. So then mobilizing the data for this project involved making the analog digital, providing sort of if, if these images have been put out there, these campaigns have been run, there's some really interesting uh, ads, for example, from Esso during the, sort of the energy crisis in the 1970s. They ran this whole advertising campaign which said, you know, the most important uh, barrel of oil that we make is the one that we save. Right, because they're looking at the high cost of oil and think about, well, it'd be great to bring out that messaging or other messaging from the archives from the 1960s and in the 80s, which is, which is one of these themes we see now is sort of the ubiquity of plastic. And you see this advertising in the 60s when you're looking at the rise of synthetic fabrics and the rise of plastics. And you're seeing this messaging now being a key component of this mediated struggle over the oil sand. So for me, what becomes interesting then is the sort of the totality of images. And maybe we have some, uh, have some limits in terms of what I can sort of focus and analyze but that becomes interesting. And this slide here hints at some of the themes that we sort of capture in analyzing and looking at this ping pong match back and forth because again, looking at media as, as a site of struggle, you see uh, NGOs start to engage with oil companies. Oil companies respond on NGO terms uh, over the nature of the environment. Uh, and then you see the, the terrain totally shift uh, in terms of the energy companies. Um, you see the absence of the natural environment replaced by sort of the man-made sort of temperature controlled environment of the Enbridge ads. So what, uh, what um, in, terms of, in terms of methods, uh, these, these points were from a, a slide about, about so lessons learned in co collecting, uh, collecting this data. But in terms of methods, uh, uh, you, know, you broke it down between project output and project construction. So output were, were the themes I was talking about, the rise in lifestyle messaging, the uh, rise of, sort of petro-nationalism, uh, the struggle over the mediation of the uh, natural environment. Uh, but project, cons uh, and I write about that elsewhere for the project, but in this context, I was thinking about project uh, construction, and for me, um, uh, I, I consider myself a social scientist, but I'm not a computer programmer. I didn't have the, the literacy, and I was lucky to have a partnership where I cold emailed a professor in computer science. She was open to the idea, and uh, it made a big difference in trying to visualize and make this project happen, because there was not a, an out-of-the-box solution uh, to work on it. So I think there's something around, uh, around skills there that I learned a lot, and you saw the gap, I think it was mentioned in, in this presentation or panel I was at, the gap between what uh, uh, computer scientists, how they're trained around the ethics and issues versus social scientists. And that was a really neat opportunity. We are actually com uh, communications and computer science are on polar opposite ends of campus. So it's sort of neat for us to come together uh, and, and work on this. And there are various data, data challenges. So for, for example, for these ads here, I had to file ATIPS, access to information requests with the Canadian government to get the ads. The idea being that I'd seen snaps and bits on Twitter, but I wanted to digitize them. Um, also had issues of some YouTube ads when uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers revamped their website. Some ads which have been public for years became private. I hadn't quite archived all of them yet. I treated you know, YouTube as static, which is I learned after that one mistake um, not to do that. But somebody had put up some rogue, very pixelated versions. So again, it's, it's backing this up. Uh, and I think you know, it's, it's something where um, there would be other ads where it would go dark one place, but an advertising agency would have it up on their Vimo channel as proof of, the, of their excellence or campaign material. So in terms of like, find, if you can't find the material you're looking for, it could exist somewhere else. Uh, and that was sort of, I can talk about those sort of uh, practices I learned. Last is what I'm doing with this, because the project funding ended May 31st. Um, I was speaking to uh, Benjamin Wu, a professor here at Carleton, last, last spring in Calgary, and he said, well, why don't you do um, a comment around this? And so I happen to have some funding for it, uh, and that's uh, what we're doing. And the idea for the, 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 the comic is to look at the various tropes in environmental advertising. The comic will be free to download. I should have a full version end of this week. The black and white, except for six color advertisers, which are tropes uh, used in environmental messaging. 
um, uh, as well uh, as well as we'll do a crowdfunder to get a paper version. But the whole idea here is to sort of look at this. If, if we if media is a side of struggle, we're engaged in this endless media war, this back and forth between NGOs and corporations about the environment, and this really clouds the public imagination to talk and think about what does energy transition look like? What does that space look like? Okay. So there's other issues around sort of the public well, the advertising as a proxy for for public discourse. But that was sort of the effort, the, the point here is to look at this this uh, sort of dramatize the struggle, and it was an interesting challenge having been somebody who sort of reflects and writes about these sort of critical stories and then trying to help engage and, and write one. So there is a mediatool.ca slash comic has a bit of information on it. You can email me on this as well. But like I said, it'll be, uh, it'll be uh, free to, uh, to download and we'll do paper versions as well. So that's me. So I'm going to talk about um, a project called Riot ID, uh, which is part of a larger, um, much larger kind of approach to dog justice that I do through um, a group that I facilitate at Bournemouth University where I work called the Civic Media Hub, um, BU Data Labs Project. And we are a group of GIS geographers, uh, computer scientists, and lots of kind of media and journalist people uh, on our campus at Bournemouth University. And we work with a really wide range of NGOs, digital designers, and a lot of investigative journalists um, based uh, mostly in the UK, but, but some internationally. Um, the project started with a small pot of funding around research I was doing into tear gas and riot control. And so a lot of these people um, work in kind of corporate watching and arms watching uh, areas, so we're sort of heavy on those kinds of sides of things. So this is in kind of grant speak um, to get kind of the, the funding for this project. What I would say that we, we do, um, it, it, which is a very kind of basic idea of, of this idea that, that for data activism, we have to be learning some of these tools and tricks and so forth. Um, and so this is just, just a kind of example of some of the um, stakeholders that we work with and how they think about and use data in all these kind of different ways in their work. And one of the things that we started to look at or ask ourselves is what is the difference between the ways in which NGOs and social justice groups traditionally collected and used what we would think of as data or information or evidence, um, and what in the data-driven environment that we're in now is, is all of a sudden expected, and how is this kind of digital gap or data divide emerging, particularly for small organizations that are doing things that are not always very fundable, like corporate watching and arms watching. Um, and so thinking through some of the <coughs> barriers, and so the broader project that we're doing really looks at strategies and tactics and methodologies um, for kind of bridging these gaps um, that NGOs and small kind of investigative organizations are um, facing. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about just one little project underneath that that we've been doing around my work on tear gas. Um, and I, I started to get interested uh, in tear gas when I realized that it was really old through my research on protest camps. And I was like, where did you know this come from and how did it become normal? And as I started to answer that question, I started to realize that there's very, 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 very little data collected on tear gas. There's absolutely no standardized international regulation. There's very little trade regulation. And there are the only times that there's any kind of death or injury count that happens from the misuse of tear gas and other forms of riot control is when particular, usually small scale, um, activist organizations or things like positions for um, human rights human rights actually go and do uh, a, a study and attempt to collect this. But most of that is not anything that we would consider data, certainly not in a big data sense. It's like very scattered bits of in fragmentary information. Um, so there's going to be some distressing images that follow. Um, so this, of course, is a concern to me because, well, we, we think often of, of riot control, or depending on who we are, as a less lethal solution. It's actually really dangerous and kills a number of people uh, every year and, and, and uh, injures a lot of people. And these are things that just are really not kind of talked about in the sort of public eye. And so part of this project was about trying to kind of gather some kind of evidence, uh, so kind of citizen generation uh, methods to kind of help people with sort of literacy around um, what tear gas is actually doing. Uh, and so we can think of this as kind of driven by what I would consider sort of, or I'm wondering whether we consider, can consider data justice research questions, uh, which is where we want kind of accountability and visibility for action, which I think is what distinguishes a kind of social justice approach from other kinds of critical research approaches, where we're actually trying to do something um, that is going to advocate or is going to, to, to regulators moving forward in that direction. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, and so the project that I'm going to talk about is an infographic or uh, graphic design project in, in which we use graphic design in order um, to try and 
uh, engender or empower kind of a, a form of data literacy and citizen data um, collection. So I'm just going to run you through how the project works and where it came from. So back in 2011, during the um, Arab uprising protests um, in Egypt, some citizen journalists or local activists started to use a WordPress site to um, photograph the riot control um, weapons that were being used against them and try to identify them. Uh, but they didn't really, you know, they didn't have expertise in this area. It was really like a kind of nation project. But it was one that, that um, myself and Bahrain Watch, a group I was working with, um, so Bahrain also had really, really mass use of tear gas and dozens of people have been killed through riot control objects there and the struggles there. Um, so we, we were really kind of inspired by this project. And then in 2014, when Ferguson happened, we got involved with some uh, journalists who were working on the ground there, trying to do kind of the same thing, but in a much more sort of systematic um, and regulated way of sort of this kind of data collection, taking photographs, identifying them. And so we were helping them to, to figure out how to do this. Um, and, and usefully, you'll see this one company, DevTech CTS, over and over again. Um, they keep all of their product specifications sheets online, making it much easier than it normally is um, to do this. Uh, and so that'll become important in a moment. But yeah, so, so we started to think a bit more systematically about how this might actually work. And then about six months after that, I was in um, the archive at Omega Research Foundation, who's another NGO that we work with, uh, and I found this um, lovely uh, a bit of paper, which was from the early 2000s when one of the leading uh, riot control companies was rebranding, and so they had to explain to their buyers what the new package labeling looked like, and of course, as a media studies person, you know, brought up in subvertising and culture jamming, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if, like, uh, you know, normal people had access to this. Um, and not only did they have this lovely little like guide to reading the label, they also had an entire iconography uh, for how to understand the, pro the different kinds of weapons and what they were doing. So I thought, hey, like, why don't we just make an activist version of this? And it just happened that that night after I left the archive, I was at a book launch <coughs> for a uh, Greenpeace project and Greenpeace's graphic designers were there, and I had a month to spend five grand um, in one of these beautiful moments where creative projects happen. <laughs> so the comic. Um, and so I uh, commissioned uh, a wonderful graphic design firm called MinuteWorks um, to, to create Riot ID uh, with me. What did I do with them? There they are. So I'm going to pass these around as well, one in French and one in English since we're in Ottawa. Um, <coughs> So this is uh, it's a, the, the real version of the pocket guide. This is a poster version. And the idea is that it just trains people how to safely and securely photograph um, uh, riot control objects and then how to identify the different kinds of them using a kind of tree diagram structure. And um, this is a map of major manufacturers. So you can start to see the branding and where they're produced and who they're produced by. Um, we have it so far. We, we do. Um, crowdsource translations. If anyone wants to translate into a language not there, let me know. Um, and so I'll show you just how it works. So this is St. Louis in 2015 uh, during a riot um, in which uh, a woman, Miss Jupiter, tweeted some images uh, and we kind of had a back and forth about how to take the photographs and what I was looking for. So we look at those images and we say, okay, um, we, we note what they are and in particular if anything doesn't belong. So in this case here, one of these things is not like the other. Mm. And that is a barricade projectile. And a barricade projectile is designed for armed hostage situations in which the armed person has a hostage behind a really like solid barrier wall. Um, and I know this from these lovely spec sheets which are online and then most companies do not have this and I'm, I'm sure after a number of presentations this one will either. But um, so we can see from the, 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 the language of the company itself um, that this is a you know, misuse of this object um, and certainly like this, this is uh, not um, an armed hostage situation you know, behind a barricade. So like no surprise there in the, that these objects are being misused. But, we want to generate data in a place where there is no data, right? So that's the kind of goal of the project. Um, these are just some other uses um, of, of identifying tear gas. So um, what does this tell us? Um, so one of the things that we learned through this was that we could use, and there's a lot of problems with this, but that we could use Twitter in a kind of to, as, a, as what it's designed for um, and actually kind of use it as a way of doing civic empowerment and, and expertise knowledge transfer. Um, so kind of taking advantage of that ability to, to speak back and to kind of train people in identification using that as a medium. And um, more importantly, it allowed us to start to build a kind of macro sense of who was 
you, what kind of companies were using what products where, and to start to kind of get a more pic a picture of what was happening, uh, you know, in a place where there was an absence of data. Um, and uh, when by doing this, right, we we want to create accountability, visibility for. Uh, action, right, for social justice action. Um, and so this is an example from the group Barinwash that we work with. Um, so the, uh, this is a weapon um, that killed a young boy uh, in Egypt in 2011, which then got identified as being uh, this from, from this kind of canister, not this one in particular, um, which we can identify as Condor, which is a Brazilian uh, company, and, and this led to a lot of uh, mobilization around um, Brazil and there are points in time where they had an embargo on, on trade um, and an, an embargo on trade. So um, that is uh, what we are doing. So the kind of two big takeaways are the graphic design can be harnessed to enable participatory data collection, data ver verification. So rather than thinking about data visualization and infographics as just a means of represent, representing things, how do we actually think about it as a tool for empowerment? How do we actually think about it as part of a process of citizen uh, data generation and, and kind of mobilizing that um, for action? And I think this is something that the keynote this morning kind of um, it, at least to me, it sort of echoed is this idea that, that by under, deeply understanding the metrics that are being used or the indicators that are being used, we start to be able to figure out how to flip them and turn them against themselves uh, through uh, these kinds of citizen data, data um, generation. And so zooming that back out, um, some of the things that we have been thinking about as ways of building capacity, um, not just through this project, but the other projects that we're doing, um, are thinking about how we politically leverage citizen data generated data, um, and how we can use collaborative and open tools, even though, of course, those tools have limitations. Um, so where are we heading with this now? Secure app, because Twitter has lots of limitations. Um, and these are the two projects that are kind of big, kind of big projects that are coming out of this. Um, yeah, and that's it. And this is the group we work with.